Amen. Remain standing, please, for the reading of God's Word. And please turn to Proverbs chapter 1. <clears throat> and hopefully my voice will allow me to get through tonight. Proverbs chapter 1, reading the first seven verses. This is really the introduction to <clears throat> the whole book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, let us give our attention to God's word. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to re receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. <clears throat> to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we pray now <coughs> for both physical and spiritual strength and enlightenment, that you might speak to us the words of wisdom, which are the words of life. Give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Well, as I said, Proverbs 1 and the first seven verses introduces us to the subject of wisdom. It introduces the book of Proverbs, particularly it introduces the first nine chapters of Proverbs. And it reveals the author of these Proverbs, it reveals the audience of these Proverbs, the design of the Proverbs, and indeed the proper response to the Proverbs. Now, Proverbs brings us counsel. It brings us advice, because as we all know, anyone with any life experience will know that life is filled with gray areas. Not everything is black and white, simply right and simply wrong. Proverbs fills that gap. It deals with the, the gray scale of life's decisions. And the difficulty is those decisions are becoming it seems more and more difficult with the complexities and the troubles and trials that we face in society. Proverbs then reveals God's will, will to us, often in situations which are sometimes less than clear. And so do you seek wisdom? Do you seek counsel? Do you seek life itself? Then go to Proverbs, for you will find those things in abundance in Proverbs. God is seeking to counsel us through the wisdom literature of which Proverbs is a part. And tonight, by way of introduction, I want to deal firstly with the character of Proverbs. I'm going to lay out a few principles which we will explore in the coming weeks and months. Firstly, we'll look at the character of Proverbs. Then secondly, we'll look at the people of Proverbs. And thirdly, we'll look at the purpose of Proverbs. The character of Proverbs, first of all. <clears throat> what are Proverbs? Well, there's many different kinds of Proverbs, even within the book of Proverbs, uh, many different formats of Proverbs. But, but in essence, a proverb is a, a short or pithy sentence or idea that packs a punch. It, it grabs your attention. It grabs your imagination. And their design is to convey a general principle about aspects of life. In that, in that sense, the Proverbs are a bit like a spiritual hand on your shoulder, guiding you this way, guiding you that way, towards the paths of righteousness and away from trouble. In that sense, Proverbs have a close connection to the law of God. The law of God says, do this, don't do that. The Proverbs kind of fills the gap 
between the law of God and the many situations in life which might not be right or wrong. Indeed, you are given liberty to do certain things. But Proverbs will give you that counsel what you should do in a certain place. <clears throat> and yet, just as we've said that Proverbs has a connection to the law, we must also be fully aware that Proverbs presents to us the gospel. It prevents to us, presents to us law and also gospel. Wisdom, Christ says in chapter 8, verse 18, Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. <clears throat> My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold using the language of Psalm 19 there, and my yield and choice silver, I walk in the way of righteousness in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasures. And so we see throughout Proverbs not only a reflection of God's absolute law, do this, do not do that, but we also see presented to us a picture of Christ. In other words, Proverbs is good news for bad people. And Proverbs present, presents this to us in a peculiar manner. As I said, short, pithy statements designed to capture a thought or a principle and certainly designed to capture our imagination. And that raises the important question of how do we understand and how do we interpret Proverbs? Well, first of all, we need to understand that Proverbs is counsel. It is wisdom. It is not always telling me to do A or not to do B, though you will find that in Proverbs. It gives counsel. So, for example, Proverbs 27, verse 14. And this is why I say that Proverbs is not law in and of itself. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, will be counted as cursing. Now, my wife can testify to the truth of that in our house, that as we rise early in the morning and we greet each other with loud voices, it's as a cursing to her. Why? Because she's not a morning person. But you're not going to find that in the law of God, are you? And nor are you going to find it in the prophets, no. What we have here is wisdom. It is, in a sense, an application of the law of God. It's general counsel about an ill-timed greeting. Now, does that mean that Proverbs, then, are absolute rules and absolute promises? And some will say so, that what we read in the Proverbs, we are guaranteed to reap in this life. And I just look at certain Proverbs to say that that is not the case. What of Proverbs 28, 17? Whoever walks in integrity will be delivered. Or Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It should be abundantly clear to us, the biblical witness shows that those are not absolute promises. The life of our Lord shows that that is not the case. The life of the apostles show that these, pro these Proverbs provide for us general counsel, not absolute promises. And yet, there is still truth in them. Because our Lord did walk in integrity. And he was delivered after his crucifixion, in his resurrection, and his glorification. And when a man's ways please the Lord as our Lord's did, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Yes, that's us. Christ's ways have pleased his Father in heaven, and brethren, we have reaped the rewards. We who were his enemies are now at peace with him. So there is always, always truth in Proverbs, but that doesn't mean they are universally applicable to every set of circumstances. So we come to Proverbs with discernment, acknowledging that they are counsel. It may be right for you to do A, and wrong for you to do B. But between that, uh, there, is, there is a gap. You have choices you can make. Is it right for someone looking to go to college to go to this college or to that college? Well, both are lawful. But wisdom might dictate one over the other. But additionally, when we're reading Proverbs, another principle that we need to work with 
is that they are thoroughly Christocentric. That means Christ-centered. And this is not a mere academic exercise that we find Jesus in all of Scripture, and neither is it a theological fad. It's a fact of Scripture. We see that in Scripture our Lord himself, we are told, grew in wisdom and stature before God and before man. But not only that did he use the Proverbs, the wisdom literature, in his own personal faith life, but he is the one who embodies wisdom itself. We are told by Paul in Corinthians that he became for us wisdom from God. So our connection with wisdom and the wisdom of God, our connection is Jesus Christ himself. But moreover, it's not just Christocentric, it's Trinitarian. Because we're reminded as we read Proverbs and we think about wisdom, instruction, insight, the fear of the Lord, that these are spirit-wrought matters in our lives. The way of holiness is the way of the Holy Spirit. Necessarily then, brethren, when we read Proverbs, not only do we see our Savior, but we see the necessity of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And of course, if we see the Son, if we see the Spirit, you should be entirely unsurprised to see the Father also. We'll read throughout many of these pages, verse 8 of chapter 1. Hear, my Son, your Father's instruction. That's not just the instruction of an earthly father or of Solomon to his son, though it is that. It is the instruction of Almighty God to you, to me to Christ himself while he was on this earth. Indeed, what we read of in Proverbs is not the general idea of God. The name God only appears eight times in Proverbs, but the name Yahweh appears 88 times in Proverbs. What are we being taught? We're being taught that our covenant God has given us a covenant document comprised of wisdom that we might conduct ourselves wisely in covenant, not only with our Father in heaven, but with each other also. When we read the book of Proverbs, we need to be thinking in this way. You need to hear Yahweh, our great Lord, our covenant God, saying, My son, my daughter, hear me, for I wish to teach you. And that's important when we come to examine the people of Proverbs, the people of Proverbs. It's a reality which should not pass us by, that God himself has given us these sayings. When we get to the latter part of Proverbs, we'll see that significant parts of Proverbs overlap almost word for word with the wisdom of the ancient Near East from Mesopotamia and other places. Don't be fooled by that. Wisdom is a concept that is defined by God. And outside of the covenant God, there is no wisdom. There is wisdom in common grace. And that is the wisdom that the nations round about us and round about Israel received. And so it's no surprise that the wisdom of Proverbs, a covenant document, is replicated in the wisdom of the ancient Near East. That's not to say biblical wisdom was copied from them. The other, other way round is true. They copied their wisdom from the only true source of wisdom, God himself. Now, what we have here, brethren, is our Father in heaven seeking to teach us, seeking to <clears throat> individually and familiarly and corporately speak to us. And frequently he does that through repetition. Frequently he does that through repetition. You see what I did there? He repeats things because they need repeating. Because we need things repeating. Frequently we are slow to hear. I wish, I wish that as a child I had made a study of Proverbs. Children, if you're listening to me, you can do a lot worse with your life than get to know the Proverbs well. I would have saved myself a whole lot of trouble in life if I had known and read and made the Proverbs my own. And so God is speaking to his children in a rather direct manner. But that takes us in the idea of the people of Proverbs 
to who authored the Proverbs. We might think, well, that's easy. Solomon did. But yes, Solomon did most of them, but not all of them. <clears throat> Interestingly, there are seven distinct sections in the book of Proverbs, seven for obvious reasons, a presentation of perfect and complete wisdom. The first section is chapter 1 to 9. We'll be dealing with that here in the first instance. Solomon wrote the first nine chapters. <clears throat> the second section, chapter 10 to chapter 22, Solomon also penned those. Remind yourself who Solomon was, a man who at an early age asked God for wisdom. He asked God for wisdom. He could have asked for anything. He could have asked for length of days and, and great riches. And God said, because you asked for wisdom and not these other things, I'll give those other things to you as well. And the text before us, verse 1 of Proverbs, points, <coughs> excuse me, points to this reality. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Immediately, immediately we understand the context of, of Proverbs is that it has a royal provenance. It belongs to the court of the king. Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And history is inexorably leading us to great David's greater son. There is therefore a messianic background to the very fabric of Proverbs. We cannot escape it. This is one king instructing his sons in the court of the king about how they ought to be not only good Old Covenant Christians, but good kings themselves. Because you'll remember from some of our studies on Psalms, as it is with a king, so it is with the people. Perhaps we can say it this way, as it is with the head of the household, so it is with the rest of the family. It takes us all the way to Christ, who set himself to the Jews, one greater than Solomon stands before you. The third section of Proverbs from 22 to chapter 24 is by the wise men. We don't know who they are, but they were wise. And then the fourth section, another part of chapter 24, is another section written by the wise men. The fifth section of Proverbs 25 to 29 is by Solomon, but compiled by men during Hezekiah's reign. So what they've done is they've taken miscellaneous proverbs and put them together. They had an editorial board, as it were, to put these proverbs together. The sixth section is by Agur, the son of Yake. We know nothing about him. Neither do we know anything about the, the author of the seventh section, King Lemuel. Suffice to say that he learnt his proverbs from his mother. And if you read Proverbs 31, you think, Wow! What a mother she was. But it's not just the authors of Proverbs that we want to concern ourselves with. In fact, it's not chiefly them that we wish to concern ourselves with. It's the people to whom Proverbs were written. Verse 4 picks up the list, the cast, as it were, of people to whom Proverbs were, were written. To give prudence to the simple Knowledge and discretion to the youth. You'll notice as we were reading Psalm 19 that the simple came up in that <clears throat> Psalm verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The simple and the youth of verse 4 carry essentially the same idea. The simple and the youth is one who is without experience and therefore is somewhat gullible. That is to say they are open to persuasion uh, for good or for ill. And it's easily easy for all of us here perhaps to dismiss these ideas, the simple, the youth, the inexperienced, and say, well, that's not me, thank goodness. Is it not true, brethren, that spiritually speaking, we all behave like the simple and the youth at times, ready to be swayed by others, ready to do something that we know is perhaps not in the best interests of ourselves or others, 
even ready to repeat something without giving it a second thought that someone has told us. You see, the simple or the youth who is young in the faith is easily moved. And brethren, that's all of us. Because why else would the Apostle Paul have picked up on this idea in Ephesians chapter 4? And listen to the connection of ideas. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro uh, by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Paul addresses that to the church. It's the same message of Proverbs. Be wise. Don't be tossed to and fro. Don't be impressionable. Don't lend your ear to the latest and greatest fad in the theological world, or the world for that case. And notice how we as Christians are to be trained in that matter. He gave apostles, prophets, shepherds, teachers, pastors to equip the saints for the work of ministry that we might grow up. That is the purpose of the public ministry of this church. It is to equip you to grow from immaturity to maturity. That's who the simple one is in Proverbs And the simple one appears frequently in the book of Proverbs, sometimes negatively, other times positively. Proverbs chapter 7, the great warning against the adulteress. For at the window of my house, verse 6, I have looked out through my lattice. I have seen among the simple and perceived, I've perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense. Passing along the, along the street near her corner, that's the adulteress, taking the road to her house. And before he knows it, he's in the house, he's in her bedroom, and the passage finishes like this. All at once he follows her as an ox, ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. That's the simple in Proverbs. He does not know it will cost him his life. Why? Because he has not equipped himself with wisdom. He has not equipped himself with the precepts, the instruction, and the law of God. But it doesn't need to end that way. It doesn't have to end that way for the young and inexperienced of faith. Because Lady Wisdom, Proverbs 9, also calls to the simple... Whoever is simple, Proverbs 9, 4. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Come, sit at table with Christ and receive the blessings of fellowship with your Lord and Savior. It doesn't have to end in death and doom. It can end in righteousness and blessedness. The reality is this, brethren, at times we are all like the simple one of Proverbs. Wisdom breeds maturity. But then back in Proverbs Proverbs chapter 4, who is the next member of the cast of Proverbs? It's the wise man. Verse 5, let the wise hear and increase in learning. In Proverbs, the one who is wise is the one who always fears the Lord. It's a huge subject in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's living before the face of God with the word of God hidden in our hearts. It is to know God And then it is to think God's thoughts after him. How much trouble would we save ourselves if more often we thought God's thoughts after him? 
Because the wise man in Proverbs is one, as we're told, who flees and escapes from the violent. He, he watches what he says. He flees adulterous temptations and finds good success before God and before man. And yet his blessing is not always physical, though it is at times, because the wise man is one who is diligent. And we're told the wise man has a return on his labors. But frequently the blessing the wise man has is simply spiritual. Proverbs 4.35, the wise inherit honor. Honor. And moreover, as the proverb itself says in verse 5, teach a wise man and he grows wiser still. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that a blessed assurance? If you're pursuing wisdom and you are taught wisdom, you will become wiser even still. But the great antithesis to the wise man in Proverbs is, of course, the fool. The fool. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Much is written about the fool and much is written to the fool in Proverbs. Now, who is this fool? I have to say, brethren, it is the covenant fool. This book is not written to the Philistines. It's not written to the Amorites or the Hittites or the Per. It's written to the Israelites. And there were fools in Israel. And there remain fools in the church. We're not talking about people who are stupid. This is not an intellectual description of people, but it is a moral and an ethical description of such. To summarize the character of the fool, we turn to Psalm 14, verse 1. You know what it says? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. There is no God. The fool, in a sense, then, is an unbeliever. He may claim to have faith. You'll notice the adulteress of Proverbs chapter 7. She claims to have faith. She claims to have done her, her duties of worship that day. And then she's luring someone to their death. They may claim to have faith, but they do not behave like it. They're called a fool because they're engaged in the most colossal sin of living in covenant with God while denying his existence. It is a most colossal sin to behave in that manner. There is no fool like the covenant fool, the fool within the church. And we're told in Proverbs, complacency of fools destroys them. The fool gets disgrace. The fool will come to ruin. The fool will be servant to the wise of heart. Brethren, you have no interest in being a fool. No interest whatsoever. And what a great warning there is for us, brethren, when it comes to the fool. You know what Solomon has been called in time? He's been called the wisest fool in Christendom. And you know why, don't you? Because at the end of his life, where did he end up? Well, we don't know. But listen to what Scripture says of him. 1 Kings 11, now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh and so on, which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father was. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. 
the wisest fool in Christendom. Don't ask me if Solomon is in heaven now. I don't know. If the writer of Proverbs could turn his back on the Lord so radically, we need to take care to ourselves. We need to take heed to ourselves. But there is encouragement that we do take heed to ourselves, that we do press on. And it's the encouragement that God gives us here, the kind of wisdom that is required to remain steadfast. And that's why we turn finally to the purpose of Proverbs. And we really see that in the first four verses of this chapter. The purpose of Proverbs. Verses 1 to 4 are really a series of purpose clauses. They speak to us about why Proverbs were written. And in verse 2 it focuses upon knowledge. What we know. Uh, That is to say there are things that we need to know that we don't know naturally, but we need to know supernaturally. Those things are to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, there is a kind of knowledge which puffs up. It's a self-serving knowledge. But the knowledge of Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs, the instruction of Proverbs is the exact opposite. Because what we read of there in verse 2, to know wisdom, instruction, understanding words of insight, we come up against it again in chapter 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight, call out for understanding, sorry, call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, what happens? Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. This is not the kind of knowledge which puffs up. It is not self-serving knowledge. It is knowledge and understanding and insight which grants us greater relationship with God, which gives us the fear of the Lord. Do we know what the fear of the Lord is? We'll come to that next week. It's a hard thing to define, but Proverbs puts a high premium on the fear of the Lord. Not only is it the beginning of wisdom, but it's the product of wisdom. 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 2-1 through 5, as you pursue wisdom, then you find out the fear of the Lord. You see, this is the kind of wisdom and knowledge of which Paul spoke about to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. He says, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What sacred writings is he talking about? The Old Testament, Proverbs, wisdom from above. What will it give to you? It will make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You expecting any less from Proverbs than to be led to Christ in faith? We'll expect more because that's what Proverbs does. It leads us right to Christ. In faith. And brethren, can there be anything more necessary to our lives presently, to your lives, that you keep a clear mind? As we're engaged in tumultuous political times, social upheaval, trouble in the church of Jesus Christ, we need to be able to discern the true faith. And we need to be able to discern not just between right and wrong, but the many shades of grain that gray that lie between them. We need to be keeping ourselves close to God. You see, we're surrounded by a profusion of self-help manuals and self-help mentors. Improve yourself. Do this for yourself. That's not the message of Proverbs. The message of Proverbs is this. Find Christ. Whatever you do, get wisdom. Find it. 
You see, God is speaking to you now. He's saying the fountain of life is found where? You'll find it in Proverbs 16, 22. Wisdom is the fountain of life. Christ Jesus is the fountain of life. Moreover, in Proverbs chapter 3, it's not just about the knowledge that we see. Proverbs 1, verse 3, sorry. It's about the reception of knowledge and instruction. I think it's true that a teacher, at one sense is only as good as his pupils. What I mean by that is this. You can have the best teacher in the world, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ was. But if people are unwilling or unable to receive the message, then the message, in a sense, does not bear fruit. But wisdom will make you receptive. Notice that, to receive instruction. Wisdom makes us receptive. And I can tell you, brethren, of the disastrous pastoral consequences that I have observed just in seven short years of pastoral ministry when people don't listen to counsel, when they choose their own way, when they're wise according to their own sight. Receive instruction. It might take some of us time to receive that instruction, to process the instruction, and we come back to it later. That's just fine. But wisdom makes us able to receive instruction. And in what do we receive instruction? Verse 3, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and in equity. That is to say, wisdom has a payoff. It affects our conduct. It affects the reception of instruction. It deals with how we deal with each other. The character of our conduct ought to be righteous, just, and equitable. Why? Wisdom is an attribute of God. That's where we get the concept of wisdom. And because it's an attribute of God, uh, when we receive wisdom, we then must conduct ourselves like God. That is to say, wisdom will make us Christ-like. So the attributes of righteousness, of justice, of equity, which by nature are alien to us, wisdom, through the new birth and the work of the Spirit, will make us proficient in this kind of conduct. How we conduct ourselves towards each other is so very, very important. Paul speaks to that in Ephesians chapter 4. We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do we do that? It's not just by the law of God. Because probably most of us are keeping the law of God with regard to each other in, in, in degree, of course. But it's through wisdom. It's through wisdom. We know how well to deal with each other. And verse 4, the target audience. To give prudence to the simple Knowledge and discretion to the youth. Spurgeon says, discernment or wisdom is not a matter of simply telling the difference between what is right and wrong. It is the difference between right and almost right. And that's where it gets hard. Or even determining when more than one course of action is legitimate, which is the wisest course of action. That's what discernment, prudence, discretion are for. Proverbs then speaks to those who are simple, who lack knowledge. And God says this to you, brethren, if you listen to my words, you will be wise, you will be discreet, you will be learned in matters which matter to me. Brethren, let's close this with just three points of application. Don't make the mistake, as I've said already, of thinking that you are beyond Proverbs. Don't make the mistake of thinking that this is all about the youth, the uninitiated, and you can check out on Sunday nights. You know better than that. Can we not all look back upon our lives, perhaps even the most recent past, and see those times where we behaved unwisely.
where we jump to conclusions about a situation or brethren. Or we wrote an email in haste. Or we entered into a relationship recklessly or taken a job somewhere without checking out the local churches. Or we've got involved in another's argument. Can we not all think of occasions where we have got it badly wrong? Badly wrong. Each one of us. I mean, if your life is anything like mine, I've got a whole list of them. We've all done it. And we all continue to do it. The answer, we need wisdom. We need wisdom. And that really, brethren, points us to the need for discipleship. Why? Because for the Christian, and even for the non-Christian, for everyone, every decision is a spiritual decision. Every decision is a spiritual decision. Nothing we do or say or think in this life can be abstracted from the law of God and the wisdom of God. Every decision we make is spiritual. And do we not crave and need that wisdom which is from above? So what will we do, brethren? Well, we'll study God's wisdom. We'll study it here. You study it at home. And we'll pray that God will give us the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that we might grow in the knowledge and grace and wisdom of Christ. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Bless us, we pray, Lord God. Make us wise. Wise for life, wise for death, wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we cry out to you. We cry out to you, we plead with you, Lord God. You have said, ask for wisdom, and it will be granted. We ask now, Lord God. From the youngest of us here, Lord God, to the oldest, grant us wisdom. That we might walk before you well, blamelessly giving glory to your great and precious name. Forgive us our sins, Lord God, for they are so many. Be merciful to us. May your spirit work in our hearts, bringing unto us, Lord God, your word. Sow it in our hearts that it might bear fruit even 100-fold. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.